Thank you, Mother Rebecca and Father Casey. Appreciate it. Uh, happy to be back among you today and again remind you uh, that Easter continues. So continued blessed Easter to all of you, and we continue to say Jesus Christ is risen. And the Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let me just give a quick review of what we covered last week in our second week together. We discussed the narrative of Jesus along with the disciples and eventually Thomas in the locked room with Jesus, then calling them to, to go forth, to be about the work of ministry and mission. And we noted as we looked at that text how the reading of this text on the second Sunday of Easter has deep historical roots. We actually located it in fourth century Jerusalem, according to the witness of Egeria, and also noted that it was um, appointed for that second Sunday of Easter in the Armenian lectionary. And we noted how in following much of that tradition, we read it on the second Sunday of Easter every year in years A, B, and C of the three-year lectionary. We also talked about how um, we, we give particular attention in the great 50 days to the newly baptized, yet we accompany them, uh, the whole church does, accompanies them in this journey because we're always in need of renewal, to come back to these stories, to these prayers, and to intersect them as our lives stand now and ask the questions about meaning and mission in relation to these texts. Um, and also, the, what we talked about last week points to an important spiritual dynamic of the great 50 days, that is the call to encounter the risen Christ in the midst of outreaching love even to the ends of the earth. We are called to participate in God's loving of the world uh, in and through the risen Christ. So the great 50 days teaches a, uh, and again, this is, this is our journey, as, as we said. We asked the question, where does all of this lead us? And mentioned that it's a mystagogical question for all of us. Again, this is this photo from the Easter vigil of the forming of the baptismal procession. But in a sense, mystagogically, it's important for all of us to see ourselves in, in that procession, not, not to be baptized again, because that only happens once, but to enter into this um, discerning of the meaning of what it means that we belong to Christ through baptism. So the great 50 days teaches us a sacramental way of living a sacramental way of encountering the risen Christ. And we're directed toward that way in the texts and in the readings for the season. For instance, this one, which um, is the collect for the third Sunday of, of Easter. Um, also, this shows up in the um, in Wednesday of Easter week. So it's actually used in both places, Wednesday of Easter week and also in the, um, in the third Sunday of Easter. But, but follow the collect, which evokes dialogues with the, um, what we might, might know as the Emmaus Road narrative. That is Luke 24, 13 through 35. But the collect goes like this, as you know. O God, whose blessed Son made himself known to us in the breaking of the bread, open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. So notice the dynamic of, of this collect. It begins in the Eucharist, as we do. It begins there, but the petition actually takes us through the Eucharist, not leaving it behind, but, but through the Eucharist to a broader way of, of, of seeing, a broader way of experiencing God's grace and God's call on us, uh, both as, uh, as individual members of the church and as, as church together. So 
It calls us to see God's hand at work in all of life, and thus what I would want to call Eucharistic living, seeing God at work in all and in all of God's redeeming work. And actually, we were, we were talking about Earth Day themes and creation themes as we were coming on today. And I think the, there's a, there's actually a, a quite nice intersection here, heck, you know, in terms of sacramental living to to allow ourselves to rightly imagine God's hand uh, at work in all of creation um, and, and, and to train our eyes to look for God's redeeming work in all of the world. The Eucharist kind of gives us the paradigm and, and for that seeing and also um, gives us the grace that enables us to see those things. And I would, I would want to remind you when, when I say that, that this is not just for pastors and teachers. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, Father Casey, when I first saw this, I was actually at a conference and they hadn't told me and they said, come on around. We want you to look at this. And there I am. I'm sort of the cover boy, but I was happy to, <laughs> happy to be that for, uh, for Perkins. But it's not just for the people who stand at the altar, right? This, this way of seeing sacramentally, it's for, it's for all of us together. Those who, those who stand behind the altar and preside, priests, pastors, they have a, 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 you know, a particular vantage point for, for seeing sacramental life, but theirs is not the only one. This is, this is a call that comes to the whole church to, to allow ourselves to see uh, God's hand at work through this uh, in, in this kind of Eucharistic way. Um, so this, this classic way that I'm talking about here has been, um, as we've been saying, known as, as mystagogy, mystagogy. Um, and here before you now is a classical text from uh, St. Cyril's mystagogical catechesis. This is, again, another fourth century source, St. Cyril of Jerusalem. Um, we now would say ascribed to St. Cyril of Jerusalem, this, this text. I have before you a translation by Maxwell Johnson, a, um, a liturgical scholar uh, working at Notre Dame these days, has been a, uh, has been a colleague and collaborator with uh, one Paul Bradshaw as well. Uh, Johnson and Bradshaw have worked together on um, on a number of pieces. This is um, a translation of the Mystagogical Catechesis of Jerusalem, um, trans you know, recently published by uh, St. Vladimir's Seminary Press. This is the most recent translation that I, uh, that I can find out there. Uh, but this shows kind of the dynamic of the method of mystagogical teaching. So imagine that the neophytes, the, the newly baptized, the infants is a term that we've, we've used, have, um, have now experienced baptism on, um, at the Easter Vigil or something like it. And they are now coming under this new period of instruction in the church's life where they are going to, uh, to take their experience and they're going to look through the lens of that experience to ask what happened and and what does this mean in our lives so so here's the uh the teacher speaking i have i have desired for a long time O truly begotten and much beloved children of the church to speak to you concerning these spiritual and heavenly mysteries but since i knew clearly that seeing is more trustworthy worthy than hearing i waited for the present time Come, let us train you more accurately in these things in order that you may know for yourselves the meaning of what happened to you that night. So this is spoken to, again, the, the newly baptized, but there's something here for all of us to hear. And he goes on uh, in, in this teaching and talks with them about some things that we have come to know fairly well. So he talks with them about their renunciation of Satan and turning from evil, that, that vow, that, that dynamic that's been there in, the, in baptismal rites for uh, a long time. <laughs> it's again, so, yeah, since before the third, the fourth century. Uh, talk to, so he talks to them about that. Um, 
talks to them about being buried and raised with Christ, that, that Romans, um, Romans 6 text, which is read at the Easter Vigil. And then um, talks with them about having been baptized into Christ and having put on Christ. Now, again, so he talks with them about, about what these things mean that they have just recently experienced, but I would contend that these are questions that are every bit as important for us now as they are to newly baptized, which is why, again, Eastertide, the great 50 days, is so important for us, because so we, we are asking the question, what, as I said last week, I think, what does it mean for us um, now that we have renounced Satan and turned from evil? What does it mean for us to be about the work of resisting evil? And, and to put this maybe in a better theological way, what does it mean for us to be co-participants with Christ in the resisting of evil, you know, in, in the doing of good? What does it mean for us to, to participate along with Christ as body of Christ in this work? And these are the mystical God, mystagogical questions, and there is never just one answer. We never exhaust the meaning of, of those questions. Well, Cyril um, moves on, and then it comes to discussion of the Eucharist. And that's where I want to spend a lot of our time, uh, a lot of our time this morning. This is the, uh, this is the ongoing mystagogical formation of, of the church. You know, you think of, you think of, um, of the rites of Christian initiation, and they are three, which is why we talk about them as, as the rites of Christian initiation classically. The rites of Christian initiation are one, baptism, obviously. Second, uh, confirmation or chrismation, right? Uh, and the third is, uh, is, is first, well, the, first, the, the, the third rite of Christian initiation for the newly initiated was first communion, right? So you had baptism, chrismation or confirmation, communion, all happening for the first time for the neophytes. But of those three, the repeatable and renewable piece of that is the Eucharist. So there are many ways, of course, to think about what God is doing in our life in and through celebration of the Holy Eucharist. But one of the dynamics of, of what's going on there is, <clears throat> um, is renewal of, of our discipleship, renewal of our um, renewal of us together in the baptismal covenant. That part is repeated week to week and even, um, and even more often. So, so this is a particularly important uh, reflection for us as we sit today. So Cyril is speaking to them and he is reflecting on that um, classic text, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and following which is, by the way, the oldest of the witnesses to, um, to Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist in, in Scripture, written in the mid-50s, <clears throat> common, common era. And he writes to them and says, And this teaching of blessed Paul should prove to be sufficient to give you full assurance about the divine mysteries. And then get this next part, of which you were made worthy, when you became members of the same body and blood of Christ. So, so he's not just talking about them receiving something here, um, as important as that is, but he's talking about them in the Eucharist having become something, having become body of Christ. And if this is, if this is seeming to be familiar language to you liturgically, it should be, <laughs> because this is something we often, uh, we often hear, um, at the point of the, the liturgy when communion is offered to the congregation. We'll, we'll come to that line, but I bet you many of you could say it because you've heard it many times, but it is, um, it is rooted in, in this particular text. Um, and of course, um, of course, baptism and Eucharist are gifts to us, absolutely, unearned. Right, offered freely of the generosity of God, these things are given 
to us. And we should continually marvel at God's incredible generosity in this and in so many ways, but it particularly as it is uh, given to us in baptism and Eucharist, we should marvel at the deep and profound generosity of God. But I invite you also, along with that, to think of our sacramental participation vocationally, and that also as part of God's deep generosity to us. That is, that admission to the Eucharist is not simply a privilege that we are that we acquire, as it were, if you want to speak of it, even, even in those terms. It's not simply a privilege, uh, but it is a formative gift that continues to be at work in, uh, in, in our lives. Um, it is a gift that continues to form us in holiness. I hope that word holiness is not an off-putting word to you, but that, but that you, you hear holiness in all of its possibilities that holiness speaks to, uh, to, the, to the way that God includes us in God's love, and we become, um, in the body of Christ, we become co-participants in that love, that God draws us along with what God is doing and makes us part of God's loving the world in very tangible, concrete real-time kinds of ways. We become part of God's work of, uh, of loving the world. And that also is a generous gift to us, that we are given, uh, we are given a vocation, we are given an identity, we are given a task by a parent who loves us deeply <laughs> and, and wants to see us grow and and, and prosper. So we, we become, um, we don't just receive something, we become something. Again, this language ought to be kind of familiar to you because it's, it's a language that, uh, that you hear, but I invite you to reflect on it more deeply. And now we're going to look even closer. Uh, now we're going to go over here. There's where we want to go. Um, Augustine of Hippo, whom we've encountered before in these conversations is, um, is the one who is credited with this phrase, uh, may we become what we believe or what we receive. May we become what we receive. This comes from a sermon, a mystagogical sermon that Augustine of Hippo delivered around 415, Sermon 272. It's actually a sermon that goes back again <clears throat> to um, 1 Corinthians 11 and 12. Again, there are, there are at least two ways that body is referenced in 1 Corinthians 11 and 12. And if you go on to the end of the book, into the letter, it's actually three. But the two ways that, that really intertwine deeply are, um, would be the discussion of the body of the sacramental body of Christ, that which is laid on the altar. But Paul uses the same phrase intentionally to talk about the church. Right? So we are, we are the body of Christ. And the third way actually occurs um, later on in 1 Corinthians, where uh, he also speaks of resurrected body. <clears throat> so there is the eschat, you know, there is the body to which we look forward here as well. So actually three uses of of body in, um, in, in 1 Corinthians, and that's worth our, our reflection. Um, but again, you, you know these words, you know, but here's the, here's the context out of 1 Corinthians. If you wish to understand the body of Christ, you're the apostle speaking to the faithful. Now you are the body and members of Christ. And if you then are the body and members of Christ, your mystery is laid on the table of the Lord. Your mystery you receive. To that which you are, you answer, amen. Be a member of the body of Christ, that your amen may be true. Be what you see and receive 
what you are. Um, again, so this, this sermon of Augustine is the source for that phrase, but really the deep source of that phrase is 1 Corinthians chapters 11, 12, and, and on to 15. Um, so, may we become what we receive. Again, this is, this is a phrase you hear often at the delivery of the sacraments. Behold what you are, may we become what we receive. And there are numerous implications. I'm just wondering if anybody wants to name any of them. Is anything occurring to you in and around this, um, this ancient idea of of beholding yourselves on the older uh, and becoming what you receive. Any thoughts about that that anyone wants to raise? Hmm. I, you know, I, I think that this is just so important as we consider that, um, uh, well, that it is, um, it is formative that, that, we are the body of Christ through baptism, but we are also in the process of becoming the body of Christ because of, you know, essentially sanctification, you know, like we are always being made even as we have been made. Right. And, uh, and so it, it is the, it is the substance that gives us, um, uh, the, the, um, the spiritual energy, the nourishment, to go then and do the work of Jesus, so to be about the business of Jesus, as I talked about in the sermon yesterday for Liz O'Donnell's funeral. Um, mm. So yeah, uh, I, I, I say it, I, I inherited it from the brothers of the Society of St. John the Evangelist who were the first ones I ever heard say this at the presentation of the, of the, um, of the gifts. Ah, okay. And uh, I'd never heard it before until I went up and stayed with them probably 15 years ago now. And, um, and it has stuck with me ever since. And even as I say the words, I feel them um, echoing in my soul uh, and calling me to embody it um, as truth, as reality in my own life too. So yeah, I wonder what others have to say. Um, please put any thoughts you have in the chat. Um, if you've heard me say, or Mother Rebecca say these words at the presentation um, of, uh, of, of the, of the consecrated elements, then you know what 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 has what has uh, what has that meant to you? And I invite you to pray into that phrase as as you hear it going forward to be asking what does that what is that going to mean for me today? Well, I put this before you from from your own life for um, for your reflection and also to help you know that. This usage also has deep historical roots. Again, we don't do it simply because it's old, but we do it because it rings true. As, as you've just said, Father Casey, this, this, this phrase is deeply, deeply biblical. But I, I, I raise it um, out of some more recent history, both for Transfiguration and for other places, but particularly for you. Um, we saw the, some implications of, of this idea in a new way last spring, when for a time we could not receive communion together. You know, while, while we were figuring that out, while you were figuring that out as, as parish and, and throughout the world, Christians were trying to figure out what are we going to do? You know, we've, we've been formed as sacramental people. Now, all of a sudden, we're in this very strange desert. And, and what shall we do about this, about this identity piece that's become so important to us? Well, <clears throat> during that time, Father Michael Merriman preached a sermon uh, that struck me deeply. Again, it was second Sunday of Easter. We keep coming back to, to that text, uh, to, to the locked room narrative, Jesus, the disciples, and Thomas. And he noted as he began that sermon that when he originally had been given the assignment, but he was going to preach on the need to gather together, ironically, right? And of course, uh, events intervened and gathering became impossible. So he, he couldn't do that. Um, and in that sermon, and there's the link, it's still there. I just looked at it this week. So if you want to look back at it, it's, it's there for you to do. Um, 
But within that sermon, long about the, the, the minutes, it, it wasn't a 30 minute sermon, but it was a, you know, this is, this is where it shows up in the, in the recording, kind of right up toward the end of minute 29 into minute 30, um, where he raises this question, perhaps the Holy Spirit is using this time to reteach us who we are as the body of Christ. Maybe the Holy Spirit is saying to us, all right, step away from the visible, tangible presence of Christ in bread and wine and rediscover who you are as the body of Christ. Find ways, even socially distanced ways, to minister to Christ in others. Striking phrase, and I remember, I remember hearing it um, in real time um, back last April. Now, of course, as we well know, under normal circumstances, this is not an either-or question. This is this is a both-and question, right? We we are actively receiving Holy Communion, and we are again hearing this call to of the of the Spirit to move deeply into the life that that forms in us. It's a both-and question, not either-or, and it should be a both-and question. But again. In this last year, it, it has become, at times, an either-or question, or at least a question where our typical pattern of Eucharistic participation has been disrupted and, and, and altered. Um, and I, I, think, I think it's right that, um, that this, this is an opportunity for us to, um, to ask that mystagogical question, that reflection on the sacrament question, um, and, and enter it more deeply into that, behold what you are, may you become what we receive. My, one of the theologians who has influenced me deeply is a Russian Orthodox um, theologian by the name of Alexander Shmemen. Shmemen, in his book, I believe it was Great Lent, uh, was discussing the matter of Eucharistic participation and frequency, which if you follow church history over the last 120 years now, you see that there has been a, a marked rise uh, in Eucharistic participation really across many denominations, Catholics included, uh, Orthodox included, certainly Episcopalians, Methodists, you know, you know in, in many cases, uh, you know, not on the same schedule, but there's been a marked increase in, in Eucharistic participation. Um, and many Orthodox, according to Schmemann, were non-communing. That is, they would, go to, they would go to the divine liturgy, but for various reasons would not participate. And he basically said it's, it's really kind of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a question that's missing the mark. He said, because all of us, in terms of our life of communion, are either in certain ways you know, living in the overflow of the grace of the last one we received, and we are, you know, in the same way, looking forward to the next, right? We are, we are either living in the, in the afterglow, as it were, um, and or preparing. And we're, we really are doing both of these things all, all the time. So, so Shemaman basically was saying it doesn't matter if your last communion was six months ago <laughs> or, or not. In that sense, you know, we're, we're still living uh, in the grace of the last one we received, moving toward the next one. Now, I'm always an advocate for frequent Eucharist, but, um, but there's, the, there's this sense in which what we had happened to us in the last year has, has made us um, maybe more aware of, of this dynamic, We're realizing that there may be some gaps between times of receiving, uh, but this is an opportunity to, to look more deeply into this, into this second question. Um, who, who, who are we becoming in this? What's the call? Um, because again, whether we received communion, well, you know, say we received communion on Sunday morning, um, we're, we're probably not at, at a Eucharistic service when we're at work on Tuesday morning, wherever that is. So there's always this, uh, this sense in which we are living as the body of Christ beyond active participation in the table much more often than we are actually in, in terms of celebrating a Eucharist. I hope that makes sense to you, but but um, you know, the, the, we had a, we had I think a particularly interesting way to 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 engage that topic within the last year. So, 
be looking for ways. Well, um, you figured it out <laughs> eventually in terms of how to how to do this at, at Transfiguration. I'll explain the photograph in a minute, but maybe you can figure it out if you've you've been involved in the uh, in the extended table work. Uh, this is actually a photograph from my from our dining room table um, on Pentecost Sunday of, of 2020. Okay. Um, so I, I, I've done some work on extended table, that is the work of carrying Holy Communion to the church's unwillingly absent members. I've done a little work on, on the history of that practice and, and uh, in terms of the implications of that practice, particularly from a Methodist standpoint, but there's not that much difference, quite frankly, in, in how the practice is, is done um, among the denominations. Um, this is another of those practices which is based on ancient historical precedent. Um, you, you can find examples of communion being carried to, um, to those who were absent in, in, by the middle of the second century in, in uh, First Apology of Justin Martyr, Witnesses to the Practice. So it's an ancient practice that we apply to contemporary practice. But for me, as I've thought of the contemporary manifestations of extended table, who's missing is the question that drives it for me and the question that, that churches need to ask. Um, and it's a question set again, not just before the clergy, but before the whole church, who is missing? I call it a congregational discernment question. And you've had a consistent practice of this ministry at Transfiguration with your lay Eucharistic visitors. I've seen them at work at various points pre-pandemic, right? And I thought, oh yeah, they do that pretty pretty well, I approve you know, of the way I, I saw you all doing it there. Um, but the fact is that, as we've said, for a time last spring, the proper response to the who's missing question in terms of sacramental participation was pretty much everybody. <laughs> we're, all, we're all missing, but you, you took what you knew in terms of this ancient extension work, and you shaped it in a wonderfully imaginative and compassionate way. I never would have imagined extended table uh, involving a few people around the altar, uh, you know, in, in the assembly space being sent out to hundreds, but yeah, there was no real reason why that couldn't happen. It just had to be imagined and, and you all imagined it and did it, thanks be to God. Um, but this is one of those questions that begins again with a very basic question, the practical question in terms of extended table, whether it's to hundreds or to 10 on a particular day is who's missing, um, who's not able to attend and what can we do to serve them, who's missing? So to that extent, it's a spiritual logistics question in a sense, right? Who's missing, what can we do? How can we figure this out to, um, to include them? But I found that if that question, who's missing, really gets in your bones and gets in your imagination, starts working there, it can take us to all kinds of other places as well. You can begin thinking, who is the church overlooking in its life together? Um, what culture, cultural racial groups is God calling to be part of God's church, and we're overlooking them in many ways. Those questions have been before us, but that's a, that's a who's missing question. It's a question about um, who's able to preside if God calls that, that person into, into that ministry. Who's able to get married if God calls persons to to, to that life together out of their baptism. Who's missing is a question that gets much broader. It starts in sacramental practice, right? But it, it, it goes way wide because as we have seen, um, you know, we are, we are praying that God would open our eyes to see God's hand in all, in all creation, kind of back to, well, back to this work of flow, of joining with flowing water, but living water. But this, this, this question, back to the collect in a sense, a God whose blessed Son made himself known to us in the breaking of the bread. 
open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. So again, um, who's missing starts in the breaking of the bread and in, a, and in a challenge related to the breaking of the bread. But it goes wider because ultimately sacramental participation is about more than just what happens at the altar. It's about a way of life. And it's about this way of, uh, of, being, um, of being a part of the flow of living water in the world. We become part of that flow by grace in and through our baptism. And we are privileged to be, as I said, co-participants uh, in what God is up to in the world. Um, God allows us a, to come along in that process and to be shaped by that process of, uh, of as it were, being hands and feet for Christ for the world. Um, and going back to this question, who's missing? I wonder if anybody wants to have a, a reflection. Is it, does anyone have a, a thought around the who's missing question? Is that making sense to you? You know, it, it struck me, again, yesterday we, we buried um, uh, our friend Liz O'Donnell, who was a deacon here for a number of years. And one of the things when I solicited the, um, the memories, the reflections on her life from, uh, from the clergy and, and other lay leaders with whom she had worked, one of, the, one of the regular refrains that came back is she was attentive to who was missing. It's so funny you're talking about this today because that was so much on my mind yesterday. And in the last week, as I was preparing to preach at her funeral, um, she and, and it was a function of her diaconate, right? So, like mm -hmm. right. the 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 de deacons of the church are are commissioned or ordained, essentially, um, uh, you know, to bear the needs of the world into the life of the church, to bring to be vessels, uh, communicating vessels of the needs of the world. And so she did it as a function of her diaconate. But you know, I. Uh, not everyone, even those ordained uh, to the diaconate, do this well and naturally. Mm -hmm. And Liz was one who, for whom this came quite, um, quite naturally and quite skillfully. She was mindful of who was missing. And for us, and, and during her tenure, there was, a, the, there was a great mindfulness that led to the flourishing of the Eucharistic Visitation Ministry. Uh, before then, um, you know, she really helped uh, um, it evolve and mature and grow into really, I mean, I, I don't know that we would have had the imagination necessary to do what we did last Pentecost to bear communion out to um, 500 people in 54 zip codes if we didn't already have a flourishing Eucharistic visitation ministry. And Liz was very much one of the instigators of its growth. And, um, and she was just so great at it. And, and we, but we need more, right? We need more than one person who's designated with the job of remembering who's missing or noticing who's missing. In a church of this size or of any size, you need a congregation, a community full of people who are looking around and trying to figure out who's missing, whether it is people who... Um, because of illness or age are no longer able to come or people like you said, Mark, people who because of um, uh, because of culture, because of race, because of um, socioeconomic uh, place mm -hmm. in society, for whatever reason, who's missing is such an important question. Yeah. And again, it is a it is a baptismal question. I I love the work of the diaconate when it functions well and it's, it's just such a beautiful thing to uh to to see uh, when when someone accepts that vocation and lives into it deeply and imaginatively right asking what could this be what can we see um out of out of this vocation but all of the all of the ordained vocations from from the from the bishop <laughs> through through the priests to the deacons um, are always there. I think to um, to help the whole of the body of Christ, all of the baptized, do their work. And so, so what what I th what I think we want to see in in any person who embodies um, 
any ordained office you know, well is we want to see that shaping the imagination of the whole body, right? So, you know, so, you know, and I, I think what you're saying is that Liz did that. And oh, she did. And, and, and thus witnessed mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the importance of that work to, to the rest of us. Uh, you know, she didn't do it again. She didn't do it because like we were paying her to do that job for, for all of us. She did it and she, she was an example to all of us of how sacred, um, uh, the sacred importance of, of that um, to us. I, you know, I would say that this is a question that a church like Transfiguration must continuously wrestle with. You know, there, there, is, a, there is a way in which a church like Transfiguration can become self-congratulatory uh, about, oh, we, well, we liked gay people before that, you know, became commonplace. And aren't we so proud of ourselves for having been an inclusive community when there were not very many and yay us. And, and there is, you know, like, um, we, we believe fully that that was um, uh, aligned with uh, uh, who God was asking us and the whole yeah. church to be, right? Great. Mm -hmm. But like, let's not stop there. We noticed that there were people missing who, who were missing from the life of the church for mm -hmm. generations. Mm -hmm. uh, and we leaned into that and made space and, and extended our invitation. But now, like, what's next? Right. Um, and like, who's the next class of people? Who are the next groups of people who have been ostracized or distanced or marginalized who are missing from our midst? And I love, Mark, so much that you're connecting with this with Easter and uh, that this is Easter work, that this is not like social justice, just right. like in a, in a broad category. You know, this isn't just like, you know, um, the catering or the capitulation to to a secular society or world, but this question of who's missing and how are we how are we responding to that? Notice that absence. This is Easter. This is resurrection work. Absolutely, absolutely, it is. Absolutely, it is. And and it and it has to do with uh, with our with our call. Um, and here's the collect for today. Again, one of the ways to follow to follow these the themes of the great 50 days and to allow them to get into our imagination is by living with these collects. This is the fourth Sunday today um, collect. And, um, and at this point in the fourth Sunday, we begin to shift a little in the emphasis from resurrection appearances, from the, the, the accounts of such, to um, to the living Christ in, in our midst and how that, how we hear that voice. And so we get the, the good shepherd narratives in, in week four, but this wonderful collect, uh, which again is calling us into participation in what God's up to. Oh God, whose blessed son, Jesus Christ is the good shepherd of your people. Grant that when we hear his voice, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever and ever. And this is, again, um, we're hearing this as the risen Christ who calls us ever more deeply into the privilege of being part of the outflow of, of love and grace into the world. Um, and that is absolutely Easter work. So I guess we're toward the end, aren't we, Father Casey? Uh, but let me just tell you a little bit about where I want to go in the last session. I want to want to want to continue out this trajectory, and I want to take us back a little bit into um, in, into Lent because again, Lent connects to to the Great Fifty Days. It's preparation for us. So. Hopefully, you have seen across the years, and hopefully, you saw this year the giving of the Lord's Prayer. To, uh, to those who were to be baptized, right? This, this gift of, of the Lord's Prayer. I want to reflect on some mystagogical meanings of that, the reflection of giving the Lord's Prayer to the baptismal candidates, and then into the baptismal call to pray for the world. This is another place where, where God is calling us to bring all that we are, including our imagination, to this task of being the body of Christ for the world as we enter into this vocation of prayer for the world, which I contend is a baptismal vocation. And the, the ritual texts all point us in those directions. And this is also work of the great 50 days and beyond, <laughs> not just 
<laughs> not just for that. Indeed. All right. So we will pick back up next week uh, and carry this forward. Rebecca, any final thoughts from you today? I've been um, awfully quiet and, and muted out because I've been having connection troubles, but I've enjoyed your, your talk so much. And I especially appreciate walking us through some of these wonderful and beautiful collects that we pray during the season of Easter, claiming the gift of the resurrection for ourselves and in our lives and praying that God would help make that, make that real. So thank you for that, Dr. Strong. It is my delight. All right, everyone. All right, everybody. We'll see you in a week. Peace. Yes. Uh, remember, you're still in Easter this week, um, so live uh, live in the light of this, and uh, remember to to be what you are, um, the body of Christ out there in the world, friends. And we'll see you soon. Amen. Amen. Bye bye.